rest. And uh, that's almost a, a, a dirty word in, a, in society today, isn't it? Rest. Who has time to rest? Listen to this. Uh, it's always fun to go back sometimes and pull from secular sources. An editorial in the New York Guardian written by a, a lady named Louise Carpenter. And this is a little excerpt from an article she wrote called The Epidemic of Exhaustion. What research points to is our inability to switch off and relax, either because of internal anxieties or those placed upon us by a boss, by society, or by all these things. The new technological age that was supposed to bring us freedom by allowing us greater flexibility is, in fact, slowly working to destroy us. It is as if we made a pact with the devil. We'll work at home, but we'll do it until 1.30 a.m. Exhaustion is now so integral to our lifestyle that it has provided a cast iron excuse for pretty much every social, physical, and emotional failing. Do we live in a balanced society? <laughs> Have we really balanced work and play or work and rest? Do we even understand what rest is? And even more so, I dare say, is does the church, are churches balanced places? Or are they just bastions of the chronically exhausted too? <laughs> balanced places. What can we know about rest, this thing called rest? Seems it's a real problem. You see, what I found in the first service as we were talking, because we get to ask more questions, is we almost all get immediately defensive with it. There's at least a little hint of it sneaks in there. Well, I have to work a lot. I can't rest. I've got to pay my bills. I've got to do this, got to do that. There's good reasons, and, we, and rest is just a casualty of the times. But what I propose to you that it's, and one person brought, well, you know, we could get into politics. You know what? It's not politics. It's not the system. It goes deeper than all of that. I propose to you that our problem with rest starts not with any of those things. It starts as a spiritual problem. It starts as a spiritual problem. Well, how can you say that? Well, let me go back to reading you something from nearly 4,000 years ago that sounds like it was written today for our time, and of course it was. Psalms 127, verse two. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep, and he, of course, being God. I found that interesting because now I was hearing everything I said. Even, even as we were talking, Rick used the word anxiety in, in, uh, in talking about uh, quieting our souls and stuff while we were singing. Anxious toil. Rest, real rest, profound rest is not something we can really even grab on our own. It's a gift from God according to Psalms 127. The interpre uh, interpretation of this is pretty interesting. Go late to rest. Uh, that we rise up early and go late to rest. Go late to rest actually, word for word, translates being late of sitting up in the original Hebrew. And sitting up actually meant to burden, to lay burdens on an animal or a person, just to stack them down with all kinds of burdens. So the, what he's talking about is people who get up early to get to work. And they take on all that toil and then they're late uh, and hold on to it until late and then uh, try and get some rest and they can't even get rest because they're dealing in, in anxious toil. Anxiety stays on top of you no matter what. He says, well, how do you get rest? He says, well, here it is, bottom line. It's a gift from God. It's a gift from God. So how do we get it? How do we get this gift from God of rest. So I started looking and I found it pretty interesting as I, as I looked into it. I thought, you know, rest is rest. You know, what has God got to say? And I found out, wow, you know what? Rest, the idea of rest is core in both the Old and New Testament. Core in both of them. As a matter of fact, it came across no less than 12 different words in the original languages for rest. And every one of them had a slightly different nuance. Rest is an, a, pretty, a pretty important 
thing for God. He designed us for this thing called rest. There's a way to do it. There's a way he would have us do it. So how is it? Well, we could spend easily, uh, do a whole series on just this one word rest, but we're not. We're just going to hit some of the highlights, starting with two of those core passages. It's one from each testament, new and old, that when I start saying them, you go, oh yeah, sure, I know, I know that text. Start with Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heaven is an earth, and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he... Wow, see, you do know it. On the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Now, the word there was Shabbat, which sounds a lot like another word we know from Hebrew, doesn't it? Sab Sabbath. Sounds like Sabbath, doesn't it? Here's the thing about this Shabbat rest. It's an intentional thing. Let's just start there. It's an intentional thing. It wasn't just something that, oh, man, I'm tired and I fell down and I rested there. It was intentional. I did enough work, God says. I've done what needs to get done and I am intentionally resting, putting down my labor and resting. Does God need rest? No, he's unlimited. So if he was resting and he made a point of letting us know it, we could say that it's for example, can't we? God told us rest was an intentional act. In the New Testament, one of the first promises made by Jesus deals with rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take upon my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find Rest for your souls. Rest. Here's an interesting thing. We say rest. I had you say it and you went ahead. Rest two times. Two different words. Two different words. Now we're uh, speaking in the Greek, but both words carry a different nuance. For one of these rests, you have to come to him. And for the other type of rest, you have to learn from him. But rest is a promise. You know, one of the greatest books, if you want it, the most ingenious books in the Bible written on rest is a New Testament book. It incorporates Old Testament principles that are not to be lost. No, we don't have to do the sun up to sundown Sabbath thing. That was never given to us. That's, that was for another people. God gave that. But the principles are still there. So let's think about this for a second. Let's see what book incorporates Old Testament principles very directly and then uses them in a New Testament way. Don't feel bad if you haven't got rated off. I got lots of blank stares when I said this. And, <laughs> and, and then Mary Lee gives herself away and she goes, Hebrews, it's written right here on the sheet. And you know what, Mary Lee's right. Hebrews, the author wrote this, and it was, why is it so ingenious? Because he started taking these meanings we're talking about, these, these six to 12 meanings, and he started to juxtapose the words so masterfully that he brought out a theology of rest from these words. Start with this, Hebrews 3, starting to get into the meat of this. He's talking, it's the book of Hebrews, so the audience we can pretty well know was a Hebrew congregation for the most part. So he's talking about their forefathers, those people who first were called out of Egypt and, and were supposed to be heading to the promised land. In Hebrews 3, 9 it says, where your fathers tested me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. They saw it. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts. Now, if you've got that guide sheet, you'll see these words underlined because by golly, these are operative words and they're timeless. And they mean as much to you as to any ancient Jewish person. Therefore, I was angry with the generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Remember we said rest is a gift from God. Here is God getting really uh, frustrated if we want to anthropomorphize God a little bit here. Here is God getting really frustrated and saying, they will not enter my rest. Why? Well, it starts with this. They strayed in their hearts. Man, that is so easy. 
you could all be sitting here and every one of us could be straying in our hearts. No one else would know because it's that inner thing. It happens so easy. They strayed in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Well, they knew his ways in a literal sense. How they didn't know his ways is they didn't do his ways. You know, there's a thing on knowing. It says you haven't really learned something until it has changed your behavior. Is that that's when you know you've really learned something. So they weren't doing life God's way. Question, step back some several thousand years and look at your society today. <laughs> Are we doing life God's way? And he swore they will not enter my rest. Rest here is a territory. Rest here is a place. He's talking about the promised land. In fact, the word used there meant an abode. An abode. A place for rest. Question for you. Talking about rest. Do you have a place of rest in, in, a, in this sense? In that where somewhere in your home or outside of this church where you go alone with God. Some room, some place. Um, you know, some say, I don't have a big house, that's hard to do. Here's the thing, it, people realize when they learn what this rest as a territory is all about. Um, uh, Wesley's, uh, you know, the Wesley's, John and Charles Wesley started the great revivals back there in, I believe, the 1700s. They were poor family. This lady, okay, get this lady, she had like 10 or 12 kids, I forget, some large number of kids, no rooms. Okay, so what she did, her place of rest was, the kids knew this, she took her apron and put it up over her head. <laughs> and when mom did this, it meant she was in her prayer place, don't bother mom. That's how small, but she had a territory she went to. Uh, it is good to have a room somewhere you go on a routine basis where you're alone with God, a place to rest. And for them, of course, the promised land of rest was the promised land. They would not enter it. They would not see that. They would not experience that rest. Why? Because they strayed in their hearts and they didn't do life his way. That's all it took. All it took. Rest. We're still told to do the same thing. We're not following. We don't follow a pillar of smoke and fire like them in the desert, but we do follow the person of Christ. So he starts playing around the author with these words a little bit. As he moves into chapter 4, things start to change a little bit. It says, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, this promised land still exists, he says, let us fear lest any seem to fall short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, those ancient Hebrews, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard it. Mixed with faith. What's Christian faith? It's simply doing life like your God does life. It just means following where he is. Did you ever stop and think of rest that way? That rest is an act of faith? That rest is an act of faith. Not a dirty word. Or it's an act of faith. How so? Well, let's just talk about that territory or that intentional place or time that's supposed to be rest. It's an act of faith. Because society says, no, no, you've got all kinds of work you can be doing. You can be earning extra money or you can be getting caught up or getting, working to that promotion or whatever it is, doing those extra chores, whatever it is. But in an act of faith, first, you intentionally take rest. Why? First thing, because God said you need to. It's a command from God to take God's type of rest. Second way it's an act of faith is this, is that in your act of faith, if I'm doing what God says, the things, these other things that are filling me with anxiety, I will give back to them and I will, I will get them done because I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Rest is an act of faith. Now, here's the thing. We can't blame the world. Is it, you know, like we, we don't have to think too back, back too far when we even think of the school system that you'd never see anything on Sunday and seldom on Wednesday because churches did things. Now, I mean, you know, forget it. Uh, you know, work schedules, everything. The world doesn't acknowledge a day of rest at all. It just simply doesn't. It's just whenever you can grab it. And that's fine because we're not bemoaning the world. I mean, yes, that is the world we live in. That's fine. But we're told we don't judge the world. 
The thing is, is how much of the world comes into our way of life. Then we start judging ourselves because that's when we're starting to stray. That is when we're starting to stray. That is when we're starting us who say we know God not doing it God's way. And the writer is pointing these things out even way back then. And here's where he gets extremely clever. As he keeps going on in Hebrews 4, picking up on verse 9, he says, So then there remains a Sabbath rest. So, ah, he just switched words. You know, we talked about that Genesis 2 and the Shabbat. We're back to that word. So he transposed the promised land rest was something they knew even earlier, way back in creation, was this Shabbat rest, this, this rest that God himself took. For whoever enters God's rest, now we're back into the promised land, is switching between intentional act and, and territory here. From his labors, God did from him this. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. Intentional, right? Strive to enter the rest. Strive is one word for rest, the, the Shabbat rest, to enter the rest, which then becomes the promised land rest. And you'll get there unless you fall short by disobedience. There's two major kinds of rest, and the way you don't get there is by disobedience, promised land rest. We're talking a profound rest. We're talking something now. All of these things, there's rest that just makes sense. You know what? You've been there. Anybody who's, who's worked and kind of got banging their, their head against the wall and you've worked and worked and now you're really tired and you try and keep going and you just mess up what you already did and you go, I need a break. That's just common rest. That's intermission rest. You need that. And so there are those types of rest you just need to do. Yeah, you can burn the candle on both ends, uh, you know, try and go for several weeks and four hours of sleep or in your job, you know, like a badge of honor. I didn't take a vacation in, in uh, 10 years. Well, do you really think that's something to brag about? It doesn't show balance. But now we're moving into a type of rest that's even beyond that. This rest is a profound God-fueled rest because in the Shabbat, in the Sabbath rest, it wasn't just an event. It wasn't just a recurring event. It wasn't a, a routine of life. It adds to it. We read up to verse 2. Now, Genesis 2, 3 adds the real meat to the potatoes here. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. And sanctified it. It's moved beyond practical common rest. You are now talking something spiritual. Sanctified. We probably got this one down here. We've hit that definition so many times, right? Sanctified means set aside for a... Uh... <laughs> well, now I'm, I'm discouraged. Holy purpose, right? Set aside for a holy purpose. I, get, I understand. You were resting. Everybody else knew it, so you just wouldn't say it and let everybody else do it. Very good. Okay. I feel better now. Holy purpose. Now we're talking about rest for a holy purpose. And if Sunday, if that's the day, because we're not, we're not that legalistic at this point. We know this in principles. It must be routine. It's a routine thing. It's intentionally set aside, and then it is acted upon. So tradition for us in, in the modern church has remained to be a Sunday. So if we consider this your Sabbath rest, this isn't just resting so you can do chores or do all your favorite hobbies and out there, those types of rests that are mentioned in the Bible. This is called Sabbath rest, and this is a holy rest. You want to know the best picture on Sabbath rest I can think of is remember way back when it says, and Adam walked with God in the cool of the evening? That's what you're talking. You're talking that hand-in-hand -hand thing where you and God are spending personal time together and in that there is a refreshment going on. There is a refreshment going on. It's a profound type of rest that if you haven't ever taken it, do yourself a favor. Build a routine where it's just you and God. Personal, just to try and come up with some illustration to show how, how this might work is for me, this is not my Sabbath, quite frankly. I, I'm a servant of God's people. So this is when I'm supposed to be giving you your Sabbath rest. That's one reason I'll work 
and work to, to try and present something to tell you and you can sit back and just try and soak it in. Rest in that respect right now. That's what it's all about. So my rest really comes, for the most part, my Sabbath rest is tomorrow. I'm like everyone else. Man, I'll tell you what, I can guarantee, especially this week, with what's going on, with everything going on, that I have a big overflow of work into what should be Sabbath rest. But if I let that happen, if I do not take any Sabbath rest, I will pay. What do you do then for your Sabbath rest? For me, it works like this. I've discovered I'm not the best preacher in the world. And I'm glad because there's better ones out there. And it's just that we can't all travel to their churches. So for me, MP3 player, phone, whatever. I've got my articles. I've got some, some speakers that truly uh, refresh me to hear them. And I'm out on a walk somewhere in a park. And I'm listening to this. And I just walk and listen, get inspired. And by Tuesday, man, I'm ready to, to try hard again. Now, like everyone else, it's real easy, and I do it. I am guilty, and I'll skip over those Sabbath rests. I mean, oh, I got too much to do, and I'll skip over, and that week will not go very well. And it won't be bad, but it'll be lackluster. Skip two weeks, it's not too good. Don't ask the pastor too much around here if he's missed two Sabbath rests, because I'm not doing so well. Miss three, and I'll tell you what, I am destitute. Spiritually speaking, I need to walk with God in the cool of the evening. I need the Sabbath rest. And you know what? I'm an extremely average person. You know what that tells me? That a whole lot of other people do too. You can't do without the Sabbath rest. You need the rest and then you need the Sabbath rest. You need holy time that you spend with Jesus. Well, you're busy, fine. Can't take it, fine. I understand. Happens to me too. But you will pay a price. And so will I. We will pray, pay a price because we will find ourselves exhausted. You'll be exhausted physically. You get exhausted emotionally. You get exhausted mentally. And especially spiritually. Rest is that important. Just a quick hit on something. There are some things that rest is, that we need all these practical things, little rests through the week, the, the routine of holy rest once a week. That, that uh, is the routine given from Scripture. But there are also things that steal rest from you. There are enemies of rest. It can really boil it down all to, to one thing, one rule of thumb. Taking on burdens that don't belong to you. You can expand from there, but taking on burdens that don't belong to you. How so? What does Jesus say about that? Matthew 6.34, you know, the whole consider the lilies thing. Is that don't worry about tomorrow. Plan, do whatever you can, but don't take on the anxieties of tomorrow because today has enough. You own today's anxieties, you don't own tomorrow's anxieties. Another uh, different, totally entirely different scenario of owning problems, John 21, 20 through 22, Jesus has resurrected. He's walking with the boys. That's scriptural, that's what he's walking with the boys. They're down on the beach. He's telling Peter, Peter, this is how you're going to end your life. It's going to be to the glory of God, but you're going to die for your faith. Well, you know, Peter was that kind of guy. He was a leader, and type A personalities have this problem. So what does Peter do? He turns and he looks over, and there's John standing there, and he says, well, what about that guy? And you know what Jesus says to him? What is that to you? What is that to you? You get your ministry. He says, what is that to you? You follow me. His burdens aren't your burdens. What is that to you? Maybe even around here we need to say that a bit more. In the case if the burdens are not ours, if somebody else is a church officer, somebody else is the deacon, if somebody else is a trustee, and that's their ministry now and not yours, who are you to tell, judge what they're doing? You know, who am I to judge their ministry? It's not my job. I can't take their concerns. It's not my job. It's not your job. What is that to you? So easy to armchair quarterback. Not just people in the church, but even God himself. God, what are you going to do about this and that and the other thing, tomorrow's burdens and this? And God comes back and he says, what's that to you? 
When we take on everybody else's burdens, you know what we do? We get miserable because we ha we're not in a position of power to do anything. And so we just get miserable. And you know what else happens? And we make everybody else miserable. Probably even the person trying to do the job. What is that to you? Those burdens don't belong to you. They're given to God, to other people in other times. No, instead, there's one last word for rest I'm going to leave with you. See, all these 12 words we're talking about is how you rest. There's one word, and it is entirely different, and it is how God rests on you. The Spirit rests upon you. And the word, like 2 Corinthians 12, 9 talks about that. The word, the only one I'm going to throw at you today in the, in the original language, teleo, and it means to perfect. See, when you rest, you regenerate. But as you're resting and regenerating, in that holy rest, you let God rest on you. And when God rests on you, he's just not regenerating you, he's perfecting you. Maybe that's why we have a lot more flaws that we don't have to have, is that we don't let God rest on us enough and to perfect, complete, or finish us. All comes back to that line, Hebrews 4.11. Let us therefore strive, for what? To enter rest. Strive to enter Sabbath rest in particular, that no one fall by the same sort of disobedience. We are commanded to rest in a certain way. We are commanded to do this because when we do, life is balanced. And when life is balanced, we can reflect who God really is. That is rest. <laughs>